Well, amen. Good to see you guys this morning. Amazing, amazing days. Continue to pray for our high desert up here as uh, seems to be on fire. Pray for those who uh, already lost their, just their property, their homes, man, up uh, by by pear blossom in that area right there and uh, God's just, again in, in that whole stuff I mean God continues to do a work Barbara was just sharing how her daughter's house burned all around but her daughter's house was saved and yet other people have lost everything and so for whatever reason the Lord does what he does but continue to pray um, I, I know that for some of you guys up in Wrightwood we've uh, opened up our parking lot in case you want to bring some of your vehicles or um, just, again, there's, there's no security here, but at least uh, you can bring um, your stuff, um, mobile home or whatever you, you can. So anyways, um, just know that. This morning, we are starting the book of Romans. So if you will, turn to the book of Romans. You will hear that phrase for the next several months, if not a year, um, <laughs> that, um, that you are to open up to the book of Romans, and I will tell you which chapter this morning we, I, I tell you, open up to the book of Romans chapter 1, and uh, again, if you want, put a bookmark there, because that's where we will be every time, for the most part, I'm up here, unless it's a, a, a special service or stuff like that, but we will be in the book of Romans for a while, if one of the other pastors is teaching, they will be teaching another book, but Put a bookmark in the book of Romans. So I am so excited. A few months ago, before we finished up the book of Acts, I was praying as to where to go next. Um, the obvious choice was go right into the book of Romans. Again, if you're part of Calvary Chapels for a while, it's like, no, cha you, Pastor, you got to go book by book. By. And, and, and so to be honest with you, it sounds like that's the obvious choice. But it wasn't that obvious to me a few months ago as I was praying because I wanted to pray and go, Lord, if there's another book you want me to go to, that's where I want to be. Not just because that's the way everybody does it or some people do it within the Calvary chapels. Um, and so it wasn't that obvious to me to, to go right into to Romans. And so a little over a month ago as I was praying, again, Lord, which way... I. I a little over a month ago, I had no clear direction to go anywhere else. And so it became obvious that we should just go systematically and steadily through or right into the next book, which is the book of Romans. And so I got excited about the book of, of Romans that now it was obvious. It was the obvious choice. So we are now in the book of Romans. I know that you're going to find this a little strange, but I have to tell you that the book of Romans is like one of my favorite books in the Bible. I know I say that about all the books that we are in, but I understand this. Again, man, I have lived in the book of Acts for two years, so it became a favorite. We will live in the book of Acts for at least a year, I'm assuming. It is one of my favorites. Again, there's so much attached to the book of Romans. Because the, the, the book, on the one hand, is so clear and simple. But on the other hand, it baffles you. And, 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 and it's hard to fathom what is in it. It's very intimidating, to say the least, not just to read it, but to teach it. In, in other words, the book of Romans is so shallow that anybody can understand it. And yet, at the same time, it is so deep that most theologians and scholars will never totally comprehend the depths, the gravity of, of what is being taught because there's so much doctrine. And oh, by the way, it's a long introduction. We're going to cover four verses, so don't freak out. Again, it's like, come on, get on with it. Um, but the doctrines that are being shared here in the book of Romans, I, I think the, theologians truly, they want to explain it. And I get it. 
And we can have fun going deep, trying to, to understand some of the doctrine that we will be covering here. And yet, the Bible never tells us that we need to understand every little thing that God does and why. You know what he tells us? Just believe me. Trust me. Now, I know that sounds really simple for some of you Bible students going, Pastor, don't, don't go there, man. Go deep. It's like, dude, we will, if we just stayed shallow, it would be too deep for us anyways. <laughs> but we will at times try to go deep. And even as deep as you want to get and have fun trying to go deeper still, you will never reach the end or the bottom. Because just what we're going to cover this morning, in the simplicity of who I am to share it with you, even that blows our mind. It will blow blow your mind as it did mine as I was studying it. Now, most commentators agree that the book of Romans is the Apostles Paul's, the Apostle Paul's greatest work. Not just because of the content of the book, but because of the, the literary style of it as well. And so it is considered by many to be the greatest book in the New Testament. And I get to try to teach it to you. And so pray for me as we go through this book, because again, there's so much that I, again, want to continue to learn and go deep with, but at the same time, how do I convey it to you without talking over your heads? And I know what you're thinking, Pastor Zeke, you could never go over our head, because you're too simple. It's like, (laughs) yes, I get it. But the fact is that we can go, there's so much here that, 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 I could, if I had to, go over your head. But I, again, it's like I have to understand it. But there's so much depth that as deep as we go, I'm going to try and make it as simple as possible too. Because again, we need to trust and believe that what the Word of God is trying to teach us is for our daily lives. Because you could be a theologian and try to, try to, try to understand it all, but how do you live it practically? How do you do that? Theology is easy to teach. Practicality is hard (laughs) because now we have to live it out. And so the book of Romans has transformed so many lives ever since it was written. And I'm sure that those who heard it for or, or heard it read to them for the first time were blown away as to the content of what was in it. Because they might have had a lot of, of their questions answered, or a lot of, yeah, uh, a lot of their questions that were answered, and a lot of their doctrine that, that, that w- it was being taught, it was now being established to them, those who heard it uh, read for the first time. Now, church history tells us that Augustine, who lived about 354 to 430 A.D., one of the most influential theologians of the church, or in the church, was impacted and then converted by a passage in the book of Romans. The story goes that he was sitting under a fig tree at a friend's house, crying over his own depravity. And he heard some kids next door singing over and over, take up and read, take up and read, take up and read. And there was a copy of Paul's writings here laying near him. And he opened it and read, Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. Just that simple phrase the, the, in, in Romans 13, 13 and 14 changed this man's life. After realizing how depraved he was, reading that taught him and, and shared with him who Jesus is and he, his life was transformed and changed because of it. Martin Luther was a Greek monk or a German monk, I'm sorry, 
and a Catholic priest. And, and he taught a series of lectures from the, from the book of Romans. And he finally understood the grace and justification of the Lord. Th this man lived from 1483 to 1546 A.D. This verse he couldn't shake as he was going through it. And, 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 and it was right in the beginning. Romans 1.17 for in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. He couldn't shake that. The just shall live by faith. Afterwards, he said, Upon, Thereupon I felt myself to be reborn and to, go, and to have gone through an open door into paradise. Just by reading that verse, it, it, it just changed him. Because of that, he breaks away from the Catholic Church and started the Reformation movement, the Reform movement, later to be called the Protestant Reformation. John Wesley, years later, on May 24th, 1736, as a discouraged missionary went unwillingly, very unwillingly, to a religious meeting in London. And something happened while he was there. He wrote in his journal, about a quarter before nine, my, I felt my heart strangely, strangely warmed. I felt... I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for salvation. And an assurance was given me, given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. You see, the message that he heard that evening was just the preface of Martin Luther's commentary on the book of Romans. And that just changed him. A few months before that incident, John Wesley had written in his journal, I went to America to convert the Indians, but oh, who shall convert me? That evening in that London meeting, his question was answered and the result was the great Wesleyan revival that swept through England. And he trans it not only transformed him, but it transformed a nation. In, in recent history, in the 1960s, a man who was part of a denomination read the book of Romans, and for the first time he understood what grace was all about. And it changed his whole life because he read it in a new light, understanding what grace looked like. And he later, later wrote a, a, a book entitled Why Grace Changes Everything. Oh, there was a movement that was already going on when all of this happened. And it was called the Jesus Movement. And that man was Pastor Chuck Smith, who was the founder of Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa. And it changed people's lives. And, and, and because of that, so many people have been, been saved. And not just through the Calvary Chapel movement, but it was a Jesus movement. Now, I mention all these people that were impacted by the book of Romans because we might recognize some of those names. But throughout the centuries, the book of Romans has transformed so many people's lives, people that we will never know. We will never hear their names. They are not written about, but the book of Romans transformed them. And they are and will be in heaven, and we will know who they are. All because they understood what grace looked like and what it meant to be justified. Again, we, we use the word grace and we use the word justified often. If you try to go to the depth of what grace is, it'll blow your mind. If you try to understand justification, you can't fully understand why. 
but we trust and we believe that those are two doctrines that we hold on to dearly because it transforms people's lives. The Holy Spirit that stirred the very first people who read and heard this letter is the same Holy Spirit that throughout church history causes revivals and caused revivals and caused transformations in people and in nations. Now, it is that same Holy Spirit who is alive today who is the same Holy Spirit that works in your life and works in my life. Nothing has changed with Him. Times have changed. Things around us may change. Cultures may change. But the Word of God has stayed the same. And the same Holy Spirit that ministered to Paul to write this is the same Holy Spirit that wants to change your life and my life. The theme of this book according to my Bible here, is the gospel of God. The gospel of God. The good news of God. And it has also been referred to, the book of Romans has been referred to as the gospel according to grace. The author of this letter is the Apostle Paul. He wrote this letter in A.D. 57 or 58. Again, when we left Paul last week, <laughs> it was already 60-something. So he wrote it several years or a few years before he ever even got to Rome. Paul wrote this when he was on his third missionary journey. He wrote it from the city of Corinth. And more than likely, he had sent this letter that he was writing to the Romans with a dear sister in the Lord by the name of Phoebe. Who, who more than likely was, was involved in trade and all, and she came from a place called Sancria, and she probably had some business to attend to in Rome, and so he sends the letter with her so that she will meet up with the brothers and sisters in Rome and hand them this letter. And because there was brothers and sisters and churches started in, in houses and stuff, it was being read all over the place. So you could imagine the thrill of hearing from this Apostle Paul. So when last week when we saw that Paul gets there, they had already heard about this cat. They already knew about this guy. And now he's there in their midst. Again, Paul hadn't visited Rome yet. But there was churches that were there. There was brothers and sisters who were there who more than likely had heard the word of God at, over in Pentecost back in chapter 2. Now, Paul was never one to build on another man's foundation, but as of this writing here, not any of the other apostles had, had traveled to Rome yet. But there was brothers and sisters there, and the work had already started. But Paul wanted to go. After all these guys had, had, had taken the word of God there, and the word was established, and the churches were cut some, somewhat established, they had the Holy Scriptures with them, and that's what they were teaching. And so because all roads lead to Rome, as the old saying goes. I'm sure many of the believers that were there and people that were coming and going all the time were being strengthened by the church in Rome. And so Paul desired to go to Rome to strengthen the brethren. He desired to impart to them spiritual gifts and establish the, the grace of God in their lives. The grace of God is what changes everything in our lives, guys. And that's what I really want to be able to convey as we go through, through this, the gospel according to grace. That we may understand it and it transforms our lives from within. It's interesting that Paul, he was, a, he was born a Roman citizen and yet he had never been to Rome. His father had attained, obtained Roman citizenship. And maybe, just maybe, that's why he had such a heart for the, Rome, uh, the, the, the believers in Rome, to be able to go and be a part of the church there. He sends it to no special group in particular, just to the church that was made up of, of Jews and Gentiles. And he addresses them both, as we will see as we continue on in the book of Romans. You see, the book of Romans was, was written to all the believers in Rome. 
the Jews there were the minority, if you will, of that city. And yet he writes to all of them. So with that, Romans chapter 1. Let's read the first four verses. Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God, which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Sounds simple enough. Paul, from Acts 13 on, Paul ditched his, 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 his Jewish name which was Saul, and he used his Roman name, Paul, from here on out. That, that, that was his name. That's the way he was known. We, we consider him the great apostle Paul. We, we, we look at him as Paul. Whenever we refer to his old life, we always refer to him as, as Paul, who used to be Saul. <laughs> but he left that name behind when he became a new creation and God was using him in such a powerful way that he would always go to his people, the Jews, and when they rejected him, he always went towards the Gentiles. And so he would use his name Paul all the time. And so from here on out, we always see him introducing himself in all the letters that he writes as Paul. Not Saul, but Paul. In those days, it was normal to start off a letter with your name. I think oftentimes now, even our text, or, or if anybody ever writes letters, you know, it's always at the end. But, but here, in this culture, you always started by using your name. And because there was other people by those names, it was customary to give a little info, a little intro, if you will, more detail of your credentials even, of who you were. And so he starts off here, Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ. It's a funny way to start off your letter. But this was part of his credentials. He was a, he was a bondservant. Simply put, Paul identifies himself as a slave. The word that is being used here for slave in the Greek, there's different words for slave, but this one happens to be doulos. Some of you guys have heard that term before, a doulos. A doulos is a person owned by another person. But it has the meaning in the Old Testament of a slave who, in love for his master, binds himself to his master for life. I think it's in Exodus, it tells us that they would, they would take that, that, that slave who was now free to go oftentimes and say, but I want to live with you. And they would take him to the doorpost and get an awe and they would pierce their ear as a sign, putting something on it, that that man is a slave, but he is doing it willfully now. He has the freedom to go and be a free man, but he chooses to be a slave to another man. And again, oftentimes those people did that because they had their master who cared for them, who loved them. Oh, they were still property, don't get me wrong. But they bound themselves to their master for life. To say, I will be your bondservant, your doulos forever, until you die or I die. As Christians, and I, and I would say as, as ministers as well, not just Christians, but even as ministers, but as Christians, as Christians, Christians are not hired servants. We are slaves, committed to the service of our Lord 
and master who is Jesus Christ. It's a willful thing that we become a slave to our master. It's interesting because the word master is the same word for Lord. And I think oftentimes as Christians, we want, we want a Savior. We need a Savior. And He's our Savior, but is He really your Lord? Well, of course, Pastor Zeke, He's my Lord. It's like, then why, as a servant, as a slave, do you ever say, no, Lord, not so? <laughs> you, you, you can't. You're not supposed to. Oh, we have a free will to say, Lord, I don't think that's a good idea. Lord. <laughs> but as a, ma as a slave, a slave was never, the, those, those things never were uttered to his master. No, not so. Not today. A slave does not manage his own life. The person who calls himself a slave of Christ, acknowledges that the Savior has power over him as Lord and Master. Sometimes people, as, as they're sharing, it's like, is he your Savior? Yes, but is he also your Lord? And that's another question. Because we really have to check that out. Because if we call him our Lord, then there's something attached to to that, that's saying that you're putting yourself under his control, that you do not have control of your own life anymore. And I know that for some, especially those of us who like control <laughs> and have control and take control, to be able to submit ourselves unto the lordship of our Lord Jesus Christ, what we're saying is, my life is not mine. The decisions I make are because you've allowed me to go in this direction. Paul, I love the fact that, that Paul wore this title gladly. It, it was his honor. Even though it sounds like it's nothing to be proud of to be a slave. Especially among the Roman citizenry. Because it is believed that there was an estimated 60 million slaves in the Roman Empire at that time. They were, they were property for people. They were nothing else but being owned by other people. And again, some people didn't like that, I, I'm sure. And yet when Paul introduces himself, he doesn't use his other title that he's going to share right now. He uses this one first and foremost. Because he understood who he was in Christ and where he stood in Christ. Oh, he says, oh, Paul, a bondservant of, Christ, of Jesus Christ, I was called, though, <laughs> even though I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a slave, I was called by the Lord to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God. In other words, I have submitted myself to the Lord, and he is the one that has called me to say, this is what I need you to do as my bond servant as my doulos this is what i'm calling this is your position this is what i'm calling you to go do again when we understand the whole thing of slavery the owner he picked and chose where he put his his property where he put his slaves some were indoors some were outdoors some were over other other slaves paul just so happened to be called an apostle for the Lord Jesus Christ. And that word apostle means one who is sent out. Not for his own glory or his own name. He was sent out by the authority of the Lord and he was commissioned by the Lord as an ambassador, a delegate. Ambassador and delegates, they don't go and, and, and bring out their own agenda. They're, they're bringing up the agenda of who sent them. They have their own opinions, and they can disagree with the one who sent them, but they are not to, to display that. They are there to say, this is what my master wants. This is what I'm called to do. Again, call yourself an ambassador. Call yourself one who is sent. Are you going out into this world preaching and teaching your own agenda? Then you're not 
being sent by the one who sent you. Because we are, we are sent by Christ Jesus and it is his message that we preach, not our own. Paul didn't make any of this up. He was representing, and we, we might not be apostles, apostles, we might be be apostles, but not apostles. <laughs> Again, not, we, we don't have that title that, that, that we adhere to, but we also are sent to go do the work. We are sent by Him whom we have called, or we have called Master and Savior. And we do his bidding, not our own. And, and, and here we see that he has introduced himself as a bondservant who has been called an apostle to be separated. To be separated to the gospel of God. Paul was not only called to be an apostle, but he was also separated to preach the gospel of God. He was set apart for a particular purpose. I think it's important for any one of us, if you call yourself a bondservant of Christ, that, that, that you are open to being sent out for His glory, that you would say, Lord, what have you separated me for? What have you called me to be? I think it's a, it's a question that, that God would love to hear from you. Because <laughs> He's going, I've been waiting for that. I have a lot for you to go do. And I think that's why sometimes as Christians, we don't want to ask, what's my purpose? <laughs> the word separated here means to be set off by boundary, i.e. figuratively, to limit, exclude, appoint, divide, sever, to mark off from other from others by boundary to separate. Now, this setting apart, this being separated, did not keep Paul from making tents to support himself. He still did what he was doing before, it seemed like. He, he had this trade, and, and even though he was now a bondservant, and even though he was now called an apostle, and even though he was separated to go preach the gospel, he still did what he was supposed to do to provide for himself and those around him. I find that fascinating. That, that, that again, God kept them doing what he was supposed to be doing to provide for, for those around him, and yet he was still called to do all these things. It never kept him from going in that direction and doing the practical, providing for his family and those around him. But the separation, even though it kept him doing the same thing that he used to do, it never, it never separated him from mingling freely on any level with the pagan society that he was a part of. In other words, he had to be out there. <laughs> he was sent not just to be in a holy huddle, but he was called to go outside that holy huddle into society that was perverted, that was dark, that was ugly. <laughs> Again, we've, we've followed him in the book of Acts. He'd go to places and he's writing from Corinth, a very perverted place. <laughs> and yet that's where he was. And he loved it. We, we, we know that he was in, in Ephesus for a long time also. Ephesus was like San Francisco times 10. Just the debauchery that was there. And yet he is still called to be a, a bondservant. He identifies as a bondservant, called to be an apostle, separated from the gospel, and yet he's in the midst of this ugly, perverted, wicked, immoral place. He's even writing from, from a place like that called Corinth. In other words, even though he was separated to something, it didn't make, he didn't make himself isolated from other things. He wasn't like the Pharisees 
who when they were separated, and it's interesting because the word Pharisee means separated ones, they separated themselves from the, the yucky people, the sinners and the tax collectors, yuck. <laughs> and yet Paul, or Jesus, shows us that that's who he sat with and ate with. And Paul was the same way, even though he was separated for the gospel. It never hindered him from going right into the midst of what perversion, perversion looked like in the day. He put himself in there. And I'll tell you why he was able to do that, because he understood who he was in Christ first and foremost. He wasn't his own. He wasn't there for his own agenda or his own pleasure. He was there because he was a bondservant. And his master says, I've called you to go out, and I'm calling you out to these perverted places. But you're not going to indulge in their perversion. You're going to go in there and change them. And it's like, can you imagine how taxing that could be if you felt like I have to save all these people? It's like, oh no, you don't have to save any of them. I just have given you a message. I save them. I save them. I just need some vessel... <laughs> some willing vessels to go into these places that are so dark to be a light for the people that are there, that are clamoring for someone like you. It's like, no, they're clamoring to kill me. It's like, I know, I know, even if it costs you your life, it's not your life anyways, it's mine. Again, when you start understanding the fact that here he is being separated for the gospel, yet... He doesn't separate himself, or he doesn't isolate himself. Paul, again, was, was working on becoming a Pharisee, if not one of the Pharisees already, one who was separated. But God captured him. God arrested him, if you will. And when he surrendered to that, he became separated for the gospel. I want to read to you from Galatians chapter 1, verses 11 to 17. Paul, and I think we've read this in the, in the last few months, but Paul says this as he's writing to the Galatians. But, in verse 11, But I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to men or man. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it. But it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my former conduct in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. And I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous for the traditions of my fathers. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through His grace to reveal His Son to me that I might preach Him among the Gentiles. I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went to Arabia and returned again to Damascus. He was called and when he surrendered, God says, now I can use you for my glory. And so he says all that. And in verse 2, he says, which he promised before through the prophets in the Holy Scriptures. There were many, many Jews everywhere Paul went that criticized him for leaving Judaism and now following this new sect, the way. This new fad, if you will, in the day. The latest and the greatest for them, called Christianity. But in reality, this was nothing new. Even though it may seem like it was new, it was nothing new. This gospel which Paul was separated to was promised in advance long ago, way before Paul had ever even come on the scene. You see, this doctrine, this teaching, the gospel, the good news, had already been announced 
before through the prophets. And it was in the holy, sacred scriptures that the Jewish people owned. It had all been in there. Through the prophets. The word prophets here is used to include those who wrote as well as those who spoke. And they all knew who these prophets were. In Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, it says, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by His Son, whom He had, has appointed heir of all things, through whom He made the world. It was nothing new that through Christ, the Messiah, people would be speaking through Him eventually. Because it says that it was in the Holy Scriptures. Again, referring to the Old Testament here, the OT. They're called holy because they were inspired by the Holy Spirit. And they were regarded as separate from all other writings and worthy of all reverence, not to be worshipped. Understand that. We don't worship the Word of God. We worship the God of the Word. That's who we worship. It was worthy to be revered, these writings, because they are the Word of God. The Apostle Paul is saying that he was not about to advance or declare something new. His doctrines, his teachings, were all in accordance with the acknowledged oracles, prophecies, revelations, and truths of God that had been written long ago before he ever came on the scene. Now, though it appeared to be something new, yet Paul regarded the gospel that he was separated to preach entirely consistent with what had been declared in the Jewish writings that they all had and understood. And not only consistent, but they were actually promised. And all these writings, this letter of the book of Romans will devote itself to show it and to prove it, so that people might examine it, read it, see it, and know it for themselves. We have that opportunity, because we have the Word of God, right there on your lap. You get to do the same thing, examine it for yourself, read it for yourself, see it for yourself, know it for yourself. The New Testament is in the Old Testament concealed. And the Old Testament is in the New Testament revealed. Nothing new. In other words, everything that we read in the New Testament comes from the Old Testament. Everything. Everything. Oh, we see it in a whole new light because we see it with the lens of Jesus and we see it through the lens of grace. And he says in verse 3, Concerning his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh. This, this phrase is connected to the, the first verse and with the word gospel. That this is the gospel of God concerning his Son. This is the gospel of God concerning his Son. The, the design of the gospel was to make a statement relative to, akin to, His Son, Jesus Christ. And that is the whole of it. The gospel surround, is surrounded by Jesus Christ. You see, there is no good news apart from Jesus. There is no good news. If Jesus never came, we would not have the gospel like we have it today. Jesus makes all the difference in the world. And there is no gospel unless it is surrounded, totally revolved around, involved in Jesus Christ. That's the only way for salvation, through Jesus. 
It says, who was born of a woman or who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh. And that promise is that the Messiah would be born through the seed of David. And as far as the flesh is concerned, we have Galatians chapter 4, verse 4, where it says, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent His, His Son, born of a woman under the law. John 8, 58, Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, which he means before Abraham was ever born, I, I am. So he, he, he was before all times, and yet he, in, he was born, he humbled himself and was born of a woman because he would be of the seed of David. And whenever Jesus is called throughout the Gospels, the son of David, it was always a reference, an acknowledgement that he is a descendant of David. And that is what made the religious leaders so upset. So upset that that is exactly why they crucified him. Because he made himself out to be the son of David. And they all knew, son of David, there's only one that's coming and that is the Messiah. So are you calling yourself the Messiah? And remember when they asked him, are you the Christ? He says, it is as you say. It's like, ah, let's crucify this guy. But he wasn't lying, not one bit. The Messiah was standing right in front of them. They missed it. But he came. And he was declared in verse 4 to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. It, it, it was promised that he would be declared, appointed, decreed, determined, ordained to be the Son of God with power power that is according to the spirit of holiness so all of this speaks of the fact that jesus was all man and all god at the same time okay i'm going to explain it and we're going to go so deep and you're going to totally understand i'm kidding <laughs> how do you understand that that, that, that what he has just shared, that he came in the flesh as a descendant, and yet he is proclaimed to be the Son of God at the same time. So what, what's being proclaimed here is that Jesus came and he was all man and all God at the same time. How do you explain that? You see, Jesus says all these things, but he proves it by the resurrection. Now, some of you guys have been around dead people. And you can try all day long to try and resurrect them. But they're there. They're dead. They, they can't hear you. That is really hard to do, to resurrect someone who's dead. On top of that, Jesus proclaimed that he would resurrect himself. How in the world does he do that if he's dead? Well, I don't know how. <laughs> Except that he predict, predicted that he would. <laughs> because in John 2, 18 to 22, so the Jews answered and said to him, what sign do you show to us since you do these things? Jesus answered and said to them, destroy this temple, and in three days I raise it up. I will raise it up. Then the Jews said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple and you will raise it up in three days. Verse 21 says, but he was speaking concerning the temple of his body. I love this next verse, verse 22. Therefore, when he had risen from the dead, later on, the disciples remembered that he had said this to them and they believed the scripture and the word what Jesus said. They didn't believe it then and there. It wasn't until afterwards going, dude, he did it. He proved it. He proved that in his humanity, he was all God. God was coursing through his veins, however that looks. 
and yet at the same time he was all God. And so what we have just covered here as we close up, these four short verses, you can go back and I want you to try and get as deep as you possibly can with it and then when your mind explodes, <laughs> tell somebody that you're going to do that in case they find you and it's like, I think he tried to go too deep. Because what we have just covered is both shallow and deep. And that's the way the rest of this book looks like. Clear and simple and baffling and hard to fathom, but it can change your life. Because of the simplicity of who God is. Do we want to go deep? Absolutely, man. Some of you Bible students, man, it's like, man, you just dig, 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 and then pretty soon it's like, yeah, I think he's wigged out a little bit. He'll come back when he, when he comes back to basics. <laughs> but let me ask you this question, and I'll close with this. If you call yourself a believer today, this morning, would you be able to introduce yourself as Paul introduced to us, introduced himself to us? Are you one who is a bondservant willingly to serve Jesus? And if you are, are you called to be sent out? And if you are, what are you separated to go do? Ask yourself those questions. Amen? Amen. Father, we thank you for all your promises, Lord. We thank you, Lord God, that even as we start digging into the book of Romans, Lord, I pray for wisdom on my part. Lord, I truly want to do it some justice, Lord. I want to explain it to my brothers and sisters, Lord God, that you would change us as we go through it, Lord, that you would take us deeper than we've ever been, Lord, and at the same time, Lord God, revealing to us, Lord, the simplicity of who you truly are, that, Lord, we might be able to be changed from within. I don't care how old we are in the Lord, that you would change us from within. But I also pray for anyone who is in this room right now who maybe perhaps have, has strayed away so far and they need to come back, Lord. I pray that you would draw them in. That, Lord, at one point that we're, when they called themselves a servant, Lord God, they, they, they started doing their own thing and, and they got off the, the reservation. And so, Father, bring them back, Lord. If there's anyone who is here this morning who doesn't know you, and needs to know you today, Lord. I pray that you would draw them in. And I want to pray for both of you. If you're far away and you need to come back, I just want you to slip your hand up, and I just want to pray for you. And, and if you're so far away that you don't even know Jesus, but today is that day, that you would just slip your hand, and I just want to pray for you. I see your hand. Amen. Anybody else? Thank you, Jesus. Father, I pray that, Lord, those who have raised their hand, Lord, whether they're coming back to you or coming to you for the very first time, that's for real, Lord. I pray that you would meet them right where they're at, Lord, and remind them who you are and that now, Lord God, they can humble themselves as a servant, that you can take control of their life, Lord, because they can't do it on their own. For my brothers and sisters, Lord, I pray, that, God, you would just use them. If they call themselves servants, Lord, if they've been called to go out, Lord, that they could be a light wherever they find themselves. Separated, Lord, from this world, but being able to penetrate this world nonetheless. So go before us, we ask, in Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand as we sing this last song.